When making a CAD model, your first decision is where to design the part relative to the datum coordinate system. Let's look at five different possibilities. First, a common mistake new users make is to treat the datum CSIS like a piece of paper. They might sketch on one of the datum planes in the upper right quadrant. Two problems with this are additional datums might be required later for symmetry, and this makes no statement of design intent in the model. It is true that in some industries it's common to design parts in place, like in an airplane or a vehicle coordinate system. For example, an airplane might be designed so that rotation about the X, Y, and Z axis corresponds to the pitch, roll, and yaw axis. Or a car might be designed using a vehicle coordinate system located at the front of the car with X toward the back, Y towards the right side, and Z up. While this is true for unique parts in the car or plane, reused parts such as wheels, seats, and other things are designed in their own local coordinate system, or you would have to design a unique wheel in each position. For now, let's ignore vehicle coordinate systems. For standard and reused parts, consider two things at the start of the design. These are function and symmetry. Functionally, it makes sense to design parts starting from mating surfaces. For example, look at this power transistor from the cordless drill. Because it mounts flat on this surface and that also removes heat, it's logical that we design the part with one plane of the datum coordinate system coincident with this face. The second consideration is symmetry, of which there are two important types. The first type of symmetry is planar. These parts in this drill have at least one plane of symmetry. It will make life easier for us if we design the part so that each symmetry plane of the part is coincident with one of the datum planes. Then as we add features to the model, we can position and mirror these features about these datum planes. Let's look again at this power transistor. It also contains a plane of symmetry. It makes sense to locate the data coordinate system at the intersection of the mounting plane and the plane of symmetry. Because the transistor mounts with this screw in this hole, it makes sense to locate the third axis of the data coordinate system at the intersection of the two planes and the axis of the hole. To create these symmetric parts in NX, a common method is to extrude the sketch using the symmetric value option on the extrude dialog box. Another method is to keep the sketch symmetric about the datum coordinate system. In NX, we can use the midpoint constraints to center a rectangle about the origin point. We can also mirror curves or use the make symmetric constraint. Often parts have more than one symmetry plane. These parts are symmetric about two planes. I would like to design these parts at the intersection of these datum planes so that I can reflect features about either plane. This makes a statement right from the start that the design intent for the part is to be symmetric. This is true even if the part is not completely symmetric. For example, these battery contacts are purposely made not symmetric so that they can only be assembled in one direction. But the part is highly symmetric except for this one locking feature. The next important type of symmetry is revolution. If the prominent shape of the part is a revolve, the best way to model the part is to sketch it so that we can revolve it about one of the existing datum axes. Although we could model this shaft as a series of extrusions, you know, sketching a circle and extruding it, it is much more efficient to model it as primarily one revolve sketch. Rather than sketch an arbitrary line to revolve about, 
revolving it around one of the original datum axes centers the part and makes a statement about the design intent and can make it easier to add the part to an assembly later. As a general rule for revolve parts, the best practice in NX is to model them using a sketch and a revolve feature. There are many other parts in the drill that are primarily revolve parts. For example, the motor and most of the chuck parts are revolved. Revolve parts typically also have a mounting surface. For example, this gearbox is primarily a revolve part that mounts to this mounting plate. It makes sense to design the part with the datum axis at the center of the intersection of this mounting plane and the, and the center axis of the revolve. We started by mentioning function and symmetry. You know, in reality, symmetry is often also part of the function. For example, the function of many of the revolve parts in the drill is to rotate or to enclose rotating parts. Both kinds of symmetry are functional because designing symmetric parts makes them easier to manufacture and easier to assemble. For example, they can go in the assembly in either direction. Before we move on, let me quickly review the five basic ways we've talked about to design a part relative to the datum coordinate system. Number one, no relation. This is discouraged. Number two, a vehicle coordinate system. Number three, making the part faces coincident with the datum planes. Number four, planar symmetry. And there can be more than one plane of symmetry in the part. Number five is revolving the part about a datum axis. Let's change our focus to drafting and look at the role of datums here. On a drawing using G, D, and T, we usually need to identify at least three datum features that together form a datum reference frame that will repeatedly and stably fixture the part for inspection. This datum reference frame forms a coordinate system nearly identical in concept to the datum coordinate system we use to design the part model. In fact, if both are based on the function of the part, we often might end up with the same solution. First, let's look at the same symmetry conditions we discussed in modeling because they exist here in drafting as well. For a part with no symmetry, all we have to do is select three mutually perpendicular planes to form our datum reference frame. So here's an example of a part with no symmetry we should select the largest, flattest surface that we could set on a granite inspection surface and label this as our primary datum feature, in this case, A. This removes three degrees of freedom when we place the part against this plane. We would then slide the part up against an edge we label as datum feature B. This restrains two more degrees of freedom. The final datum feature C restrains the last degree of freedom and completes the datum reference frame coordinate system. Notice that what we call faces or surfaces in modeling are called features here in GD&T. In GD&T, these are called datum features, not datum surfaces. All right, what about symmetric parts? We, we can't actually attach a datum feature symbol to a datum plane because this isn't a real surface on the physical model. But we can do something very similar. We can attach the datum feature symbol to what is called in GD&T a feature of size. This is typically what we might have created with an extrude or a revolve feature in modeling. I know it's confusing that different terminology is used in CAD modeling and in drafting with GD&T, but that's just the way the industry has evolved and we have to live with it. 
In this power transistor drawing, datum A is attached to a feature, you know, this bottom face, and datum B is attached to the feature of size of the width of the part. This states that the part is to be restrained symmetrically for inspection because it is a symmetric part. It also simplifies the drawing because it makes a statement about symmetry on the drawing. This is an important distinction to make, whether to attach the datum feature symbol to a feature or to a feature of size. Make sure you understand the difference. Well, you might ask, how, how can we fixture a part like this symmetrically? Well, here, for example, is a centering vise that could be used to center the part for inspection. It's important how the datum symbol is placed on the drawing to state that it is being attached to the feature of size and not to a feature or a, a feature surface, we might call it in, in the CAD world. It should be attached directly across from the dimension. Revolve features are also a feature of size. By attaching a datum feature symbol to a diameter feature of size, we are in effect saying that the center axis becomes an axis of the datum feature frame. For example, in this wheel, we use the center diameter as the secondary datum feature. Functionally, this is how the wheel is centered on the hub. And again, although we can't directly attach a datum feature to a center axis, we can attach it to a diameter feature of size. In modeling, it doesn't really matter which axis we revolve the part about, but in GD and T, it does matter if we choose the diameter as a primary or secondary datum. In general, for long shafts, the diameter feature of size should be the primary datum, but for something shorter, like a wheel, the diameter should be the secondary datum. The general rule is whichever is more stable should be the primary datum. Now that we have discussed datums in modeling and drafting, let's briefly talk about assemblies. Maybe we actually should have started here because the assembly often dictates the function of the part. For example, where parts mate or fit together. As you might suspect, there is a corresponding function in assemblies to each of the concepts we have shown in how datums are used in modeling and drafting. For example, in NX, when we add assembly constraints to parts in an assembly, we are often joining them at the same mating surfaces we used to define our datum reference frame for GD and T inspection. This is only natural because fitting together in an assembly is part of the function of the parts. Where parts mate at flat surfaces, we apply assembly constraints to the mating surfaces. When we constrain a symmetric part, we can create an assembly constraint of two surfaces between two other surfaces to constrain the part symmetrically in the assembly. By constraining the symmetric transistor this way, it will remain centered if the part size changes. Using revolved parts, where shafts fit in holes, for example, we apply assembly constraints to these axes. As you constrain two parts together, you are removing the degrees of freedom between them, just like we did with a gd and datum reference frame. Sometimes this is called the 3 two, one rule. The first mating surface removes three degrees of freedom, the second constraint removes two more, and the last constraint removes the last of six degrees of freedom. In summary, when you design parts by their function, you often end up using the same datum planes in modeling as for datum features in GD and T and assembly constraints in assembly modeling. This results in CAD models that are easily understood by someone else because the design intent is clear using an efficient modeling strategy. In drafting, this same datum reasoning helps us determine good features for our GD&T reference frame 
used to fixture the part for inspection. The same symmetry conditions as in modeling determine whether we should attach datum feature symbols to a feature or to a feature of size on the drawing. And if we don't start with a good datum reference frame, GD and T feature control frames we add to position other features on the part will be meaningless. So lastly, if you follow the same logic and things like the 3 2, 1 rule when creating assembly constraints, you'll be less apt to over or under constrain the components in the assembly.